Now, though, we're going to be looking at uh, Eborn's Greatest Writs, which I thought was clever enough to read out. Uh, uh, Andrew Eborn joins me now, barrister and broadcaster. Andrew, good evening to you. Oh, good evening, Paddy, and how lovely to see you in the evening, having seen you in the morning over the weekend. I know, what a joy. That, that was a shock to the system, actually getting up at <laughs> four o'clock. I'm not, I'm not used were all to that. Days. It was brilliant. I know. More platforms than Paddington. Yes, I was on with David myself the following day and I was doing Peter's show uh, just before. But it was a wonderful thing to see you. I think you were, you were going to go home and watch a movie and cuddle up with your dog. Weren't and you, it's, exactly, it's exactly what I did. It's exactly <laughs> what I did all day. Uh, right, let's have a look and see what uh, what you've got for me this evening. Music Absolutely. photographer Alec Byrne is suing Getty Images for copyright infringement. Tell me a bit more about that. Yes, and it's a real fundamental right. Everybody who is watching and listening around the world, your zillions of audiences, are all copyright owners. And what that is, it gives you a bundle of rights to stop people reproducing your work without your consent. And what's happened, this particular photographer, Alec Byrne, is a very famous one. He is suing Getty Images, uh, who have used some of his very famous photos of bands such as Abra and Fleetwood Mac and the Bee Gees, basically without his consent. And these photos were taken sometime between 1969 and 1973. And he discovered it because he started seeing them in various publications. Now, the reason this is important is, is a number of things, is that everybody, as I say, is a copyright owner. And when you take a photograph, uh, basically you as the photographer will own the copyright in that photo. Now, the really interesting thing, Petri, is if you give your phone, as we did over the weekend, to somebody else to take a picture of us, the person, arguably, who took that photo could own the copyright in that photo and therefore could stop you using it. Um, on your so own all phone? Sorts of, yes, isn't that extraordinary? Because the rules, basically, wow. has never been tested. This could be a, a, a first for the Petri, the Petri show, the legal news, everyone's greatest writs, um, is that basically if somebody else is taking the photograph, there's an argument that could be put that they could get the copyright in it. Uh, now, what, the reason it's important, and copyright basically lasts for 70 years after uh, the photographer's death, um, and basically and the exception to it is if it's created in the course of employment or they've signed an agreement to the contrary. So it's a really important bundle of rights. It's things that you write and so on and so forth. In this day and age when AI is taking everything over and it's scraping the internet for all of these images, including social media, um, knowing what your rights are are really, really important. So I work with lots of people, as you know, around the world, basically helping them protect their rights, but also making sure that they are, like any other property right, they are the rightful owner of those rights and therefore, if somebody does use it, that they should get proper recompense. Yeah, it's an interesting one as a, as a presenter or a voiceover. I once did a voiceover for a company that sells cars um, and they paid me and I signed uh, a, a document uh, when they paid me. But it was supposed to be an internal uh, use of my voice. Um, and it was used externally, and there was nothing I could do about it. So well, they, they, I, so they I, paid, I, me, I, they paid yeah. me pennies, which they would have had to have paid me a heck of a lot more to use yeah. my voice um, in other territories and uh, externally. But I, I well, never, I couldn't. I, 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 I would say, Petra, there is something you can do, and I would have fought that case for you. But as, as the owner, I couldn't of the afford rights, you. When... I couldn't afford oh, you. I don't, I, I would do it for you for, you for nothing, Petra. It's always a now, Everybody to heard that, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a verbal contract no, right there. It's so important. And it was a long time ago. Rights yeah, rights. I know it is. Yeah. But but you, people take advantage. Uh, you yeah. know, I, I got did something again the other day um, as, a, as a sort of friend, friend of a friend thing. And uh, he sent me this this uh, this thing for me to sign, saying he could use my voice in, in you know, for ever. What's that word? Perpetuity. Perpetuity. Perpetuity thank there you. you. Go. Um, uh, and um, uh, on any platform and anything he wanted. And I said, "Are you actually mad? I am not signing that." So no. So people do try to take advantage. Yeah, and especially in this day and age, because what's happening now as AI it can mimic your voice, and what you yeah. don't want to find is that the the Petri show is done by by a bot. Um, because this particular person has managed to get your voice and you've given them As long them as I get paid, the bot can do and, it. 
a bot can and do And that it. is such a sensible approach. And actually, joking aside, that's exactly how the industry should be looking at it. Because if you understand the basic rights that we have, a lot of it's to do with, OK, it's a property right. And like any other property right, if people use that right, then it's about commercial terms. And as you know, I work with equity and I've been warning them about this for years. But people like Bruce Willis would license his face, which he yeah. did to a Russian telecom firm. Uh, so even when he stopped acting, um, David Bowie, who was always a revolutionary, he basically put provisions that his likeness and music and everything else shouldn't be licensed for AI because uh, he wants to make sure you get control of it. And what's going to happen in the future is that you're going to continue, you're going to have these digital resurrections of artists where they can continue mm. going forever. So it's understanding what the technology can do and making sure that you put appropriate safeguards in place. And if anybody, the offer is open to anybody, do get in touch at Andrew Eborn. I'm here all the time. We will make sure we fight the fight and make sure people understand that rights really are important. They really, really are. Especially, I mean, especially for artists, I think, and photographers, uh, people like that who put their work out there um, for us to enjoy and they have every right to be paid for it. Um, the EU, uh, companies in the EU have sounded the alarm over the draft AI law. Now, this was a law that was being brought in to control AI. And a lot of companies are saying, no, we don't want it controlled. We want to see how far it can go. Well, this is the problem, isn't it? I mean, it was Stephen Hawking who said AI is perhaps the greatest human achievement, but also the biggest existential threat. And I was talking at the AI summit uh, just a couple of weeks ago where Rishi Sunak was saying that he wants the UK to be at the centre of this for regulation. Uh, and what the, basically a dozen of the Euro, Europe's largest companies, including Siemens and uh, Airbus, have spoken out against the proposed EU regulation because they're saying the rules could risk harming competitiveness. And I think what you don't want to do, you don't want to shackle the sort of creativity and so on and so forth. But you do need to put some sort of safeguards in place. And the problem with the Act at the moment, it is very wide reaching. And obviously, it doesn't apply in the UK. It will take many, many years to discuss and so on and so forth. But we do need two basic sort of systems, if you like. One is what is about uh, the in, i.e. how does the content get put, uh, put into these machines? Uh, uh, scraping the internet, using copyright works, as we said, needs to be regulated. And we need to make sure we understand when that happens. And the other is the output, if you like, because uh, you can get all sorts of fake things. We saw the, the fake Pope uh, dressed in a puffer jacket. Uh, the devil and I may love Prada, but uh, the Pope prefers a puffer, is what they say. Um, but all of these fake pictures, we need to know that we're, we're basically drowning in a sea of information, most of which is false. It's going to get so much worse as AI starts taking over, if you like, uh, and putting all this sort of false material out there. So they're looking at ways that you should identify when a work's been done by AI and so on and so forth. The the problem is there are huge fines for those who uh, who fail to comply. But the big boys and, and girls, like the Googles of this world and so on and so forth, they're not really the ones to worry about. It's these bad robots who will be using AI for mischief, if you like. They're the ones who want who we, we need to sort of control. And I think that, that getting them to sign up to any of these things is going to be very, very difficult. Yeah, I mean, I was just looking um, today at some of the fake news around about the, the riots, the French riots. And some of the images that are out there are literally taken from films. I mean, they're not yeah. real. Oh, no, absolutely. And absolutely. people are, being, and, and are people being fed this poison and it's not accurate. It's just it's yeah. just a lie. It's a downright lie. Yeah. And, and it's, again, understanding how some of these AI systems can actually not even existing footage. They can create footage. You say, show us a riot scene and put, put the Eiffel Tower in the background. Yeah. Um, and it can create it. So we have to, I always urge people, question everything. And it's always the thing, we're always, we rush, don't we? We want rush to be first in the news, that everybody wants to report something. And actually facts come out. Uh, and it's, it, we need to make sure that, uh, I think we live in a very diseased information oh, space I couldn't agree moment. with you more. And people only want to see what backs up their own prejudice or their own belief system as well. Uh, absolutely. So, and, and, you know, and what happens? You yeah, won't question what happens? it. You won't question yes, it. One of the images is of a van with a door open and loads of young men on there with a machine gun. It's from a film. And yet if yeah. I question that because I thought, mm, don't think that looks right. But people who want to believe that that's what's happening won't question it. And that's the and, problem and, that, and that's in. exactly the problem, Patrick, because you can now search for if you want to find an image. 
uh, that basically confirms your prejudices. Yeah, it confirms your um, bias. It, it, exactly. That, then that, that will happen. And if there isn't one, then AI can create one for you. So we're a very, very, very dangerous space at the moment. And we do need to make sure that people do question everything. People need to work out what can actually happen in this space and, and make sure they take appropriate safeguards. Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more. Um, talking of which, authors are now suing OpenAI, claiming mass copyright infringements of novels. Yes, this is absolutely right. Again, what's happening is, as I say, it's the input. Uh, again, going back to copyright, which is such, such a fundamental right which everybody has. And what it is, it's a class action, which is filed in San Francisco uh, on Wednesday. And basically they said that it would rely on harvesting mass quantities of copyright protected work without consent, without credit and without compensation. And what they're seeking is a court order that the company infringed the, the writer's work when it illegally downloaded copies of novels uh, to train the AI system. Because that's what happens. The AI gets trained on copyright works. It can then give summaries and so on and so forth as a result of that training. So we do need to be absolutely aware that commercial, as we touched on beforehand, commercial systems need to be in place that you ensure that the relevant owners of the property, the intellectual property, uh, get uh, appropriately rewarded. Uh, you might remember Getty Images is again where they were sued they actually were the people suing the ai art generator stable diffusion mm. uh, because they in, the, in that case they were using all sorts of copyright images in that situation so again as i say two aspects to it one is what's going into uh, the ai to feed it and the other is what comes out of it uh, both of which we need to be very very careful about yeah getty don't like it when people plagiarize their stuff and yet they do it to other people typical well, it, um, <laughs> it's, it's always the way copyright works both ways mm. uh, twitter um is has been sued by music publishers for 250 million dollars Yes, it's basically all of this is a wonderful copyright theme going throughout. And a group of 17 music publishers in the US uh, has sued Twitter. And it claims that the platform enabled copyright violations involving nearly 1,700 songs. And these are some of the, the big uh, firms, which are basically their Sony Music and their Universal Music. And what's happening is all these platforms uh, are basically using uh, music. Uh, but Elon Musk, we're all musketeers, uh, he's got big plans for Twitter, having spent an absolute fortune, 44 billion to acquire it. And it's becoming more than just words. You can now get videos on and so on and so forth. And it's going to become a bigger and bigger case. Um, but there's precedence for this. The other big platforms like YouTube and so on and so forth, which use copyright works, they have to come to a deal. Uh, it's going to cost money. Uh, because they are using copyright works and it is going to be needed on that sort of basis. But it is interesting what Elon's doing to try and get people to sign up and get new generation for money. And I don't know if you notice um, on Saturday, uh, various people say that temporary limits were put in place. Yes, I don't understand number. this. I mean, how many people scroll through <laughs> pages and pages and pages and pages of Twitter? Because I don't. Well, well, you, I, you'll be surprised. I got, I got the the, the block saying, "Hang about, you've you've seen too much." Um, and and, and I, 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 because what happens is you, you scroll through these things very quickly, and you might respond to it, and so on and so forth. Um, and it's working on that sort of pre uh, on that sort of premise. But basically, what happened is Elon put out a tweet, and it was a bit confusing as to uh, how it all sort of started. But basically, he sort of said that uh, on Saturday, um, he said that people were uh, limited to reading 6,000 posts a day, um, uh, unless it was an unverified account when they could be six, limited to 600. 600. Yeah, yeah. Not... So 600 if you're unverified. Yeah. In, other, in other words, if you haven't paid for your blue tick, you're limited to 600. Good. If you have paid for your blue tick, uh, you limit it to 6,000. That then went up in a matter of minutes to 8,800. And, and then three hours later, uh, it was now up to 10,000, which is where he is at the moment. So if you've got a blue tick, you can see 10,000 tweets. Well, if you're paying, you should be able to see everything, shouldn't you? Uh, and that's exactly the point. He's the arguing that what's happening is these uh, AI bots are scouring all the different tweets now to get that information. And he's arguing that basically he's trying to limit that. But at the moment, the way it stands is 10,000, 1,000 if you're unverified, don't have your tick. And if you're new and unverified, you only get 500. It doesn't sound a lot. But as I say, I think I used mine up very quickly uh, in less than an hour. And they said, well, you, you, <laughs> that's more than enough. It probably was, actually. It's, it's probably it's, it's, better it's, it's, it's for you. It's, it's good for you not to have to, yes. to go through all of that tripe. I mean, there's so much. <laughs> 
on 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 there that is just vile. And I, I six hundred is or a thousand is way more than I'll ever need. Uh, I well, can, I, 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 can I, I guess that. if you work on the basis, if, if you only pick the ones that say nice things, and they only ever say lovely things about you, Petri. And, and when we come on together, yeah. I, it's such a joy to read them. I might read them more than once and, and retweet them. It's always that, always fun. I but do no, get very nice limit. comments. It has to be said. I have got very, yeah, and, very and nice richly audience. Deserved. Yeah. Richly deserved. Nobody works harder. It's a joy. <laughs> <laughs> a very nice audience. Um, listen, we haven't got time to go through the to, through the rest, but I just very quickly want to hit on the uh, basic legal right to bank accounts because we're hearing now that people are getting their bank accounts uh, cancelled because they might be a PEP. Yes, no, absolutely, potentially, uh, basically politically uh, challenging, if you like, on that sort of basis. There's a fundamental right under European law to have a basic bank account. We don't have that in the UK. And you have people like Nigel Farage uh, has had his bank account taken away. There was a vicar who wrote to a particular building society and didn't like their policy uh, on, on trans and inclusivity. And apparently he was being rude. And so they took his bank account away. It is a big, big issue. We need a fundamental right to have a bank account in this country because without it people cannot operate you cannot have your salary you can't have credit cards uh, you have problems with mortgages and so on and so forth it needs to be looked at these particular cases with Nigel and others have raised this as an important issue it really is an important issue like you said it should be a basic legal right uh, thank you Andrew, uh, great, uh, great as usual. Andrew Eborn, their barrister and broadcaster, talking us through some of the big legal stories at the moment. Stay with us. We're going to be talking, well, is it cricket or not?